and welcome to Your Questions Answered. We are the Dadly Boys of What Culture. I'm Adam Wilborn, joined by Michael Hamplet and Michael Sidgwick here to answer your burning wrestling questions. Normally we do do this live on YouTube, but uh, technical difficulties mean we are having to pre-record it today. Nevertheless, we will soldier on because we do daily wrestling podcasts where we review Raw, SmackDown, the show formerly known as NXT, Dubai. Oh, AW Dynamite, AW Collision, pay per views, premium live events. We have interviews, roundtable discussions, and a round of the week complete. A very good quiz, of course, on wrestle culture. As I said, though, joined by Hamlet and Sidgwick, let's dive into the comments. Uh, and let's start with this one from Big MGM. <laughs> What do you have as the worst pay-per-view of the year? For me, it's Double or Nothing 2023, a show you both went to. Thanks. Yeah, that was consensus when we left the building, wasn't it? I mean, I'm not being funny. <laughs> WWE put on Anarchy in the Arena 2, and everyone loses their goddamn minds, right? It's not the worst. One of the payback fast lane one two punches was like yeah. I would say significantly worse than double or nothing. Payback, payback was the yeah, I didn't payback watch payback. Was I was busy. That was the one. It was payback the one with Rollins Nakamura main event? Yeah, and not even the one that some people liked. Like, I'm not being that was a total gentleman's three. It probably would have been the most boring thing, the worst thing on either show stacked up against double or nothing, with the exception of Cole Jericho, which in every conceivable way <laughs> was a disaster. Um, I payback. Just a television show masquerading as a nut, as a premium <laughs> live event. Um, I I always say with WWE, with the amount of resources that that company has, like the amount of like talent that exists both globally and on their roster, I would say about 95% of which they could sign if they so desired. You cannot have that boring a three-hour experience and the fast lane payback one punch combo, particularly when those matches in a certain form had already been seen on TV. Unacceptably solid is the t is the description I would use. So I, those are my answers. I would agree completely. It's payback for me, and I'm not just saying that because we both were at double or nothing. It's I can't argue either because I didn't watch payback. I was <laughs> eternity, so and it's not even really a WWE AW thing here. Um, I thought All Out was massively overpraised, but it had what a lot of people would have said would have been match of the year with Starks and Danielson. SummerSlam was a bit of a dud, but it had Cody and Brock on it. Mm. And a match of that standard elevates cards. AEW relied on match quality, even when the booking was trash. Mm. Payback had an out of out. Like, WWE's been hot all year, and there's nothing really I'd take from that. They had a, had a Miz TV that existed to kick off Cody bringing Jay to Raw, but it was an angle. You know what I mean? It was an interview in the middle of a pay-per-view because there was very little, mm. like, hot on it. Fastlane had that tag title change that I really, really enjoyed. So it's, it's and like, yeah. and as I say, the Nakamura-Seth mm. rematch mm. was, I, I didn't love it, but I could see why people found a bit more to like about it. Um, so yeah, the AW pay-per-views, like, in 2020, they've kind of relied more on the good matches than anything else, but they're so good when they're good that you kind of just lift them out of the conversation. Like mm. they, it can't be an all-time worst pay-per-view if it's got like an all-time great match and AEW still brings that. So yeah, it's payback. Uh, Malachi Magorian, apologies, apologies if I've butchered your name there. Thank I think you. it was a live show. He was it indeed. Was, yeah. All the way from Northern Ireland. Yes. To see us for the show. Uh, thank you for your donation and uh, uh, your commitment to Christmas pints on us. Thank you. Um, Thanks for an amazing night of the live show, which, of course, you can now watch on our What Culture Wrestling podcast YouTube channel. Um, with Rumble season upon us, what are your top three Rumbles ever? For me, 92 and 01 are still the goated Rumbles. Happy Christmas, guys. Hope you all have a good one. You too, Malachi. I'm a bit of a Rumble hipster, especially when it comes to, well, and I'm an anti-favorites one. I think 92 and 01 are good, but not in my top three. Wow. 1994, absolutely goated. Uh, new generation takes too much grief because the quality of the roster often uh, sort of stood in active opposition to some of the bad booking, basically. Bret Hart's selling of that leg as he limps to the ring and then basically lies down and takes a kick in until he somehow managed to survive his way to a gloriously executed double elimination finish with Lex Luger is the stuff that I don't think many wrestlers can do, quite honestly. It invented and innovated the diesel run that has been used time and time again to great effect. And I'm not just saying that because I'm a Nash mark, like a super effective way to get a guy over pretty much in one night. Uh, so I love 1994. My favourite Rumble ever is 2010. Uh, 
it's not just Shawn Michaels' one man show as he <laughs> desperately <laughs> clings on to his opportunity to try and get the Undertaker one last time, and what a performance that was! Like, kind of re-educated people on how to actually get eliminated in a rumble, and nobody can do it. Every rumble elimination looks fake when you contrast it next to Shawn mm. Michaels. Believable, Jesus Christ, I'm letting go. Uh, CM Punk was fantastic in that. He had the very satisfying Edge return and the victory. Mm -hmm. uh, like, it gets forgotten about because it was Sean's story, almost, and said, so I love 2010. Uh, and then there's a third one. Um, I th most rumbles are pretty great. The 2018 was really I good. I'd say 2018. 2018. Is that Nakamura? Nakamura wins yeah. it. They do the kind of the really first nice... First women's rumble, yeah. Yeah. First women's rumble was really good. They do the really nice... Uh, Bala and Nakamura, Roman and Cena, Final Four. And it was WWE, and they were never really going to deliver on the promise of that. But the idea in the moment was certainly very nice. And if you listen out just really carefully, you can see John, hear John Cena calling every single spot. Michael Hamflet, you refer to yourself as a Royal R Rumble hipster. A little bit. I am a Royal Rumble arsehole. <laughs> <laughs> you know that... You know, uh, you know, you know... You know if you go on X, and if you don't, congratulations. <laughs> uh, but if you go on X, Twitter, there's like this famous engagement bait post. Was it Hercules, the Disney film? When, like, what wrestling, film, football yeah, opinion like that, yeah. has you like this? And it's all the knives at the throat. What wrestling opinion has you like this? I don't like the Royal Rumble as much as everybody else. Okay. I like watching it live. I think that it's worked in a way where the people in it still wrestle as if they are all 300 pound, either big, you know, fat guys, hmm. or like just total roid monsters where they're sort of like trying to heave each other out of the ring or just punching people in the corner. I, I think the Royal Rumble, in terms of how long it goes and how it's kind of worked, needs to be adapted to the modern style. Genuinely, oh, I think they're going for ages. I think they're very, very long for the sake of it because it's always been that way. Mm. It's very much the, the five-day working week of wrestling matches. Yeah. I mean, I love a five-day working week. <laughs> Please never take that away from me. Um, because we work here, by the way. Because yeah. we work here. But I can understand like, why people would want to do and should maybe do four. Um, I just feel like it's a bit antiquated in its mm. format. And I don't get excited watching it that much. I'm often literally clock watching, which I know is half the point. Um, so I honestly don't like the Royal Rumble as much as a lot of people. And that's a total sacred cow suggestion. Mm. Um, in terms of, and it is for that reason, right, that if you had to say, Sidgwick, go back and watch one Rumble, you have to do it. I'm going to give you 60 quid in this ridiculous hypothetical scenario. <laughs> what would it be? Yeah. And it would be the men's Royal Rumble match of 2020 because they took a completely different approach to it. Brock Lesnar, his body language, his banter was unbelievable. The idea that he could just toss out these geeks instead of making them go in there for 20 utterly pointless minutes yeah. doing nothing half the time. Just get rid of the obligatory way in which it's structured, have them eliminate people in hilarious ways. Brock Lesnar basically selling tentative fear of Keith Lee did exponentially more to put Keith Lee over than someone in kick pads going 25 minutes and Michael Cole telling you it's impressive. <laughs> and then Drew McIntyre by beating that version of Brock in that match and how handily he destroyed all comers in it made him feel big in that moment. Um, so the t men's 2020 for me, I thought was unbelievable. I tell you, like, it's not exactly a And the edge thing as well, Nicholas. Yeah. It's not a hot take based on how bad 2014 and 2015 were and how poorly the 2016 one versus all Rumble were received. But the 2010s was uh, quite a bad time for the Rumble mm. as well. It was well, dismal. It's not just... killed. I'm the only person who doesn't think this is just lovely magic. Well, every year. I think... Well, I'm the, the only person. The pro to your point about the how eliminations became about just lugging guys over in the corner or whatever, it's, it was very, very, very Vince McMahon is washed because it was it's just counting in music pops. That was all it was. The amount of times, like, like we've had, like, number 30s that no longer are a surprise because... It's got to be this person coming back, or it's mm. got. So it's like, hang on, how is that random surprise yet again drawn number thirty? There was so little art applied to it. There were the rumble when they really sort of 
affected the formula of the match in terms of how it was worked and what you're supposed to do with it, I would say was probably from about 1990 onwards. First few were a bit experimental. But then even then, the Mega Powers explosion like was teased in the Rumble 89. Mm-hmm. So they knew it could still be a vehicle. But once it became a storytelling device deep into the 90s, there was a really good spell for it where it was everything people said it was. Um, I don't just think it's an in-ring thing. I think we're still in the process of Triple H kind of reminding people it's supposed to be a storyline driver as well. 2023 was a step in the right direction. I really enjoyed these years. Baggy right? for me. I would agree. And, and like not the most memorable of all of like, like Triple H's mini success story since taking over. So I th- it's like it's a work in progress of him like bringing it back to life because it did start to feel like it was dying on the vine like everything else, like Vince McMahon was booking into a grave. Two more takes on this. I think people will be shocked at how many people come out for the men's rumble in particular and think they're really over. They could do mm. something with such and such. Mm. Like I think the fruits of his labor will yeah. um, really sort of come apparent in the 2024 men's rumble. It tr- it's Triple H. It might go along for the sake of yeah. it. This has been a career sort of thing of his as a wrestler and indeed Booker. When I talk about how Rumble should be worked differently, to be more specific, right, these are younger, well, fitter, more athletic wrestlers who, for better or worse, do this hybrid style with a lot more a lot more dynamic, it's a lot more exhilarating, and then they just become different wrestlers almost in the Royal mm. Rumbles, and I find it like a weird dissonance. More people should work than like Jack Perry. Jack Perry... More people should be nice to him. He's done one really bad thing. It's not, it doesn't form a pattern of behavior. His, oh my God, he's going to get eliminated right now. Mm. He gets your heart in your mouth. Like I imagine seven year old me did watching a big fat guy get tumbled over. Yeah. But things have changed now. Jack Perry is the one person I think, right, watching Battle Royals, Royal Rampages, Royal Rumbles alike, who really gets how it should be worked um, for this day and age. If you, uh, there was a question, I can't find it off the top of my head now. Uh, who do you think, other than the obvious ones, are contenders for this year's Rumble? Or next year's Rumble, sorry. You only need two, realistically. It's two massive ones in the men's already. So it's yeah, a- That's the thing. If it wasn't for Punk coming back right, I would be more willing to suspend my disbelief that Cody wasn't going to win purely thinking of the double bluff situation yeah. wherein you might think that Triple H would think it's too obvious and we've always got the chamber and we could always put whoever goes against Seth and win the Rumble and do a shock that way. Um, but now that there's two clear favourites, it does feel like one's going to win the Rumble, one's going to win the chamber. Basically, they have to do an exceptional Rumble for me to think any differently. I don't even think there's any contenders. Gunther's a shout, yeah. I think. Like, I like the idea of him being so dominant. Well, as another, like, long-standing champion in Warrior did. Like, having that title for such a long period that it could believably take it to WrestleMania to fight the champion. Um, again, I thought he was one before CM Punk. I think it felt like they were showing you something last year with the Cody Gunther ending that, oh, this is one to go back to either as a singles match or, as they did with Michaels and Undertaker, use that rumble as a very um, patient long-term thing where it's like, eventually we're going to get to this. Here's a glimpse. The Rumble offers this. Like, I'm going to get a glimpse of my dream match. That's going to happen at the Rumble. The Punk and Cody thing, advertising them now is to get you excited about the two of them potentially clashing. But if somehow they don't deliver it, it's okay because they didn't promise it. So it's still it's still this potentially magic thing. Um, but yeah, it is hard at the moment to look past Punk. It's, I appreciate the question, but it is very hard to look past the favourites. And it's supposed to go that way as well. You're supposed to... this. The Rumble is supposed to, in spite of the draw and the randomness of the draw, there is supposed to be a tier. Mm. And as a result, if, say, an underdog gets the number 30, then they've got a far bigger chance. They're closer to the title than they've ever been in the weekly churn of it all. So that's supposed to be part of the fun of it as well. And there's sort of a, a, an upper tier of contenders for the Rumble in the women's side of things as well. It's Bianca Belair, Bailey, and Becky Lynch. Yeah, it is. I'll be more invested, I think, in the drama and the unpredictability of the women's match, certainly. The women's match, unfortunately, the last few years has been like launched in 2018. Far and away the best ever year for women's wrestling in WWE. What's happened is, and it absolutely should exist, but in reality, it's been used to obscure the problems in the division by showing you 30 women rather than being able to take advantage of 30 over women. Mm. That's become a massive problem. Either like they lean way more on legends than they do in the men's one, or it is just one or two contenders and zero pops for 28 wrestlers. It's been 
quite damning on the booking of the division in the last couple of years. So they could do with like a hot rumble in the women's division. Uh, speaking of unpredictability, John Catter says, I know we all want Kingston Mox for the uh, CC final, but I propose this alternative. Danielson Mox leading to the split of the BCC. We've uh, heaped praise on the Blue League recently. What yes. do you reckon that book him? Um, I don't hate it because in either outcome, right, just to refresh, Kingston goes to the final and potentially wins. Or you get Danielson versus Moxley and Kingston fails and it's all a bit heartbreaking. But yeah, and the BCC. Kingston being a prominent over baby face on AW television or the end of the BCC, which if anything is holding everyone back, not merely Wheeler Utah. I mean, I'm eating good either way. And <laughs> um, just on the BCC and why people, why I personally don't think it's an effective group and uh, why I want to see the back of it. I think the kernel of the idea originally was great, but as I've sort of learned over the past two years, it's not as simple as pairing a younger wrestler with a experienced star veteran, no matter how clever they are, no matter how good a teacher is. This device in AEW is, has banked on it since day one with Guevara and Jericho and all the rest of it and various other examples of like Sting and Darby, it elevated Darby, I guess, but he was already like, I don't necessarily think you needed Sting for that. It's just nice to watch them wrestle together. Mm. They've banked since day one on younger star associates with, uh, younger prospect associates with established big time star, hoping that they will get the mythical rub. And I think the, the, the mythical rub is precisely that. It hasn't really happened at all. Like, Darby Allen didn't come out of nowhere, get it, like, aligned with Sting. Mm, it's yeah. already on the up and up. A lot of people already thought, I mean, he won the TNT title before Sting debuted. Yeah. That's how far along he was in his development. Um, so the BCC initially formed as yet another vehicle that hasn't worked for its stated goal. Um, I think AEW really needs to relax and think of different ways to present new stars just as an incidental take. Um, so it's done nothing for you to... It looked like it was going to, and then it didn't. The idea floated around could have been that they recruited both Utah and Garcia, and maybe a third when Claudio Castagnoli made up three established guys. Then there could be some kind of split. You could have some early All Japan stuff where the young generation are like really pushing to defeat those three, or you could have a Cobra Kai esque storyline, which I've pitched fantasy booked a million times wherein sort of Garcia where Danielson and Utah they feel like the biggest pricks of the bunch and Mox and Garcia if he ever joined feel like the more sympathetic likable honorable dudes and then you have this sort of Cobra Kai separate dojo and then they have a big fight on pay-per-view what's it done you've had the BCC basically they've had that endless sort of almost like just ceaseless, never-ending program of the JAS, which is such a plane of the gallery, tell, don't show. Our oh, wrestling's better than sports entertainment, isn't it, guys? And stuff. You've shown me that in your storytelling without telling me um, for it to be the case. That didn't work. And ever since, like, what have they done? They're mm. a loose collective of like-minded mm, individuals yeah. more than they are stable. They play heel when it's convenient and babyface when it's convenient. The, the, you don't get the best out of Moxley, and why wouldn't you want to get the best out of someone who can make people in the late 30s believe in heroes again? That's probably <laughs> the best character you can ever freaking have in pro wrestling, and that's what the magic they had with mm. Moxley. Now he just feels like he's hard and like indiscriminate badass, and the charm's gone. Danielson, I'm never going to complain about this Danielson AEW run, except if you're going to be really pedantic, <laughs> he has sort of been this tweener for mm. a long time. Mm. That's all I think. This, the American Dragon Sadist character is outstanding, but, you know, if you picked a side, maybe that would be even better, even more productive than the mess when they were feuding with Phoenix and killing him and then having a feud with Starks and Big Bill at the same time. What, how am I meant to interpret you? Yeah. And it's like it's, all of these things individually end up being great, but you just got to think of the alternative. Just imagine the possibilities of what you could do with Danielson and Mox separately as single stars, as single characters, could just do on their own. It would be so much better. I am convinced of that. They sort of feel like they're um, E-fed characters right in their own trajectories, don't they? Like there's so much indulgence in I like. We're all so hard, hard and tough. But we're also funny this week, but we're quite sensitive this week. We're bare asses this week. It's, 
uh, well, I wasn't told ahead of time which one you were going to be, so I'm quite thrown by this. Uh, I'll just love um, Kingston and Kingston beating Brian is more important to me than him winning the CC. So in my sort of booking of this. C2. Sorry. So that's not what we're calling it. Is that what we're calling it? <laughs> like second to the G1. That's quite nice. I like that. Uh, like, um, not this year, brother. <laughs> no. The, um, the Brian and Kingston, the first Brian and Kingston match where he's got the Kingston as a bum sign at the end. If they're in their league final and Kingston gets a hold of Brian as a bum sign and beats him, that's validation ahead of him losing again to John Moxley. His big win is that he's finally overcome Brian Danielson, mm. if only then to lose the thing he holds dearest at the very last uh, sort of hurdle, and his hurdle being his best friend turned worst enemy, John Moxley. I, think, I still think that's... I didn't really want Moxley in the final when this all started, but they've booked it and him with enough conviction that I'm sold on the bigger picture. Uh, nightmare scenario, Swerve winning it because he's above it. I that's, do not that's want also him the that fundamental problem with the belts is that yeah, it's, it's already established as not quite yeah. tippy top and Swerve has sailed beyond that point. A world triple crown and international. Come on, it's all a bit too much. Yeah. Uh, C2 though, it's great. It's yeah. brilliant. Shout out to John Harrison who says, good Monday boys, you're all simply wonderful human beings and because of you I feel part of the best community on the internet. Keep safe and look after Aww, yourselves and one another. Thank you so much, John, uh, for That's your great. Consistent you, support throughout the year. And Bala says, what are the hallmarks of Gado's booking during his prime? Can you find his influences in Triple H and TK's booking and how different are Triple H and TK as bookers? Um, with Gado and Triple H, they both bloody love a lengthy title reign they love a small cast of wrestlers who they can build around um like a long main event for well, whatever reason to the detriment sometimes yeah, yeah um i think ghetto was probably better but only because i just if i watched that version of new japan weekly for three hours as opposed to i'll personally will dip in and out of the road two shows I used to be so dialed into new japan pro wrestling and they both were very very basics forward mm. um but in a really sort of incredibly effective way ghetto's big thing for me was if you can if you have a wrestler x beats wrestler y but then wrestler y goes on to do bigger and better things then they've got a really sort of natural first title defense or whatever um, so I thought that was a really clever tactic. Um, I think Ghetto and Triple H are not that far away in terms of th their philosophies, their long-term title reigns, how like sort of the big main events are the key. Um, I just thought it was a bit more exciting, but Ghetto didn't have what was ultimately... Episodic pro wrestling TV can, do, can be done brilliantly, but it's such a problem and solution. You see so much of it, it's so easy to get sort of bored or disillusioned with it. If it just end for two months a year, everything will be much different. Um, Tony Khan, again, the problem and solution to his booking is that he's everything to everyone, mm. often to himself. He'll take inspiration from Ghetto. He'll take inspiration from Fitch, like from Bill Watts. And he's never discovered an identity of his own. But the lack of identity is AEW's identity, I think. They are meant to be promoting the self-styled buffet. And it's weird. It's like, it's great. Because the idea is you don't get, like, every pro wrestling booker, other than Tony Khan, has had this sort of really rigid, this is how it goes and this is how I do it. Like, Tony Khan's more flexible. You can tell he was a fan first and a specific mm. type of fan first. But the idea is... If you don't like one aspect of wrestling and you see a lot of it on AEW TV, you can never fully get behind the cause. Um, but I get on Triple H are very similar. I just personally think Ghetto had better acts to play with. Yeah, I was going to say that, I think, at the time. And, you know, this comes down to the booker as well. So you've got to have an eye for talent and you've got to kind of spot and sometimes take risks on people. I think Triple H is... Quite risk averse, but that's not to say he won't just gamble on somebody. But I think he doesn't want to be in that place to what he was like as a wrestler. He doesn't, he's got like this deep rooted insecurity about everything that he does, and that can motivate you to do your best. Mm. But it does stop him getting in the way of taking risks. And I don't think, I think Ghetto would have just listened to his gut and sometimes gone with somebody at the expense of any feedback. And then he was would have been proven right enough times that you, the fan, then come to trust the process. And trust for me is the biggest thing. Triple H is, has done... Cody losing has got such parallels to Naito. That's exactly yeah. the example I was going to use. Like, you've got these massive stages, huge shows, 
everybody in the mud are making the same call and then the book are going, no, it's this. Now, what that requires to do that is guts, but the assumed trust of your audience. Triple H will earn it big time if and when Cody Rhodes wins at WrestleMania and WWE continues roughly on its trajectory mm. before business inevitably starts to soften whenever that comes. Uh, but again, like Ghetto had that for years. Like I would say Kenny Omega and Kazuchi Ricardo the first time around, that match got, well, it changed everything, didn't it? But like that match and Kenny not even hit his finisher, that one tiny detail let you know as a viewer, if you were brand new and lots of people were, that, ah, so I already see the reason for the rematch and how this is going to go down the road. But in the meantime, not only have I been introduced to this guy that couldn't quite get it done, I've just been introduced to the best wrestler in the world because he stopped him. Like that kind of, the level of ambition and thought that goes into the layout of a match like that when you are planning so far into the future is something that I think Tony Khan was better at and Triple H, Triple H hasn't yet mastered but currently has the trust to do so. Yeah. Tony Khan right now is dealing with a bit of a trust issue. Yeah. And that happens when bookers like kind of maybe past their peak. It can be won back, but that's one of the hardest things. I, I, Ghetto's lost it. He's lost that trust. Like he's, he's lost the trust. And realistically, the Ghetto of old would have just been bold. All right, Nakamura and Styles are going. Right, well, it's Naito and Omega, step yeah. up sort of thing. And he did it with the Osprey and Jay White as well. Now, I don't think he's got that faith to really go with whoever might be replacing Osprey and potentially looking at news overnight from Super J cast Carter as well. Um, I will say about Ghetto is that I don't think a wrestling booker was as good as he was for as long as he was. It's a big one, isn't it? From 2012 to 2019, maybe even 2011 actually to 2019, right, at the very least like seven years of just, well, this is the glory years, like year on year business growth as well if you want to be that much of a loser wrestling fan, <laughs> like as opposed to your subjective enjoyment. Um, I unbelievable he was. What a shame. Let's get some more Wrestling's of the finished. questions. Um, Luke Cullen says, Merry Christmas, Legends. Thanks for getting me through my toughest year this past 12 months. You're welcome, Luke. Thank uh, you. I mean, it's incredible to hear. Uh, don't underestimate, underestimate your impact. Question for you, what is your best Christmas Day memory? <sighs> it's been a while. Uh, <laughs> uh, I got... I'll keep it on topic and because I know it to at least be a true one and not some it's really nice having kids at Christmas for like how magic they see it's really knackering as well like I got that blue fed ring and I got like whatever was available I think like six or something. I got like a Hogan a warrior and I'd been into it about like I got interested in through playing with some action figures Mm. Uh, as much as it was, uh, but they weren't mine, as much as it was like getting tapes off my uncle and stuff, my cousin had them. And you know, when you're a kid and it's just like, well, that, and it's that like, it's the kid version of, well, I've got this, I've completed life, that's good. Yeah. Tick, tick, tick. And I, I just, I remember the box. I think my dad must have wrapped it because my mom was a much better present wrapper. And he wrapped it in such a way that he'd obviously just ran out of paper and thought, I'm not buying any more. And there was a one corner of the box where the block logo and he's like, I know what that is, that's a frigging ring. And I could see it before I'd even unwrapped it. And I just remember that sheer excitement of going to it. Like going at first, very happy. Uh, probably when my both kids were the age where they knew something really special was happening for them the next day, and I've got a picture of us taking um, photos. Obviously, one's got the bike and one's got the scooter, and they're both visibly losing their minds, and it's not staged at all. So just how much they love Christmas, like right now how much they are anticipating. And we've got the elf, he's a little tinker, he comes into our house, right? My five-year-old daughter is enchanted by the elf and the misadvent misadventures he has in the night. So much so that one Saturday morning, I was just having my cup of coffee and I know it was Charlotte was just doing some scribbling. She likes to write just like her dad and she'd written, buddy, I love you and just like the say anything moment. But in front of the elf, the, the thing, I love you, Ah, oh, I mean, that's just what, it's just lovely. They just let themselves believe and it's a magic. For me personally, there was a Christmas where on the last day of term, right? I was, I was in year seven and my sister was in year 11, right? Last day of term, my sister decides to glug, 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 get pissed at someone's house, right? <laughs> so much so that she kind of is very obviously and visibly drunk during her end of year party in year 11. Mom and dad have to pick both of us up. So oh. I have to go home at the same time. Yeah. I miss my party, right? 
but here's what I do. Back seat, my sister's like, uh, uh, <laughs> and my parents are furious. Just with her in general, how embarrassing it is. And oh, poor me, it's my party. So like a complete vulture. <laughs> right, I go, I know what I'm doing. I know what I'm doing here, I go. It's, um, everyone seems like they're in a mood. This is Andrew and Christmas. <laughs> oh my and, God. and my mom and dad go, you, Suzanne, you, oh, you upset your brother. You ruined Christmas for your brother. Let's just say, I wake up on Christmas morning, <laughs> and is there a Nintendo 64 there? Yeah. Is there, is there Mario, Super Mario 64, GoldenEye, and Mario Kart 64 there? <laughs> yeah, hang on, hang on. Let's go to the dining room. This has only ever happened once. Oh, there's a bike in there as well. <laughs> <laughs> bonus present in the Double <laughs> bonus present in the dining room because they're so worried that the spoiled little bastard is going to be in a <laughs> scared on Christmas Day. I think they call that playing a blinder. Thank you very much, Suzanne, for that. Oh God, I think I can follow that. I'd, right, if anything, I'd, I wish I had a, a time machine <laughs> to go forward to this year's Christmas Day. It's been with Eric, it's going to be fun. Imagine getting a, a time machine and going, I'll just go eight days I've in the future. Just, right. I just saw red there. I was so angry with you. <laughs> You've never made me cross in all the time out. I've known you. And you yeah. said, I wish I could go forward to, like, when my eight days. child is slightly older. I was fucking... I haven't got to that. Left across the I desk. said, that would be nice. But that's not what I'm going forward well, in time God. for. I'm going forward in time for Secret Banter on Christmas Day that's going to drop on the YouTube channel. I'm still angry with you. Go back to 1997 when it was better. Because... Let's just say there might be a brackets. All of it, all I mean, of it was I'm, better. I'm, I'm, Gran Turismo. If I had the if I had the time machine as well, I could be in attendance for a special guest who uh, may or may not be oh, arriving. Pretty good on yeah. Secret Banter. Yeah. Um, you just wait. You've got a time machine. I know. And then I'll probably go back to <laughs> yeah. Just wait. <laughs> just be patient for the podcast. No, no. I want to go right now. Um, He's probably got the raw video. He can just show you back at your desk. <laughs> You were there. <laughs> I know he wasn't, was he? Trying to plug our stuff, guys. Um, so uh, you got that. And maybe another <laughs> special prize coming the way on the YouTube channel on Christmas Eve. Maybe Christmas comes early this year. That's all I'm saying. Um, but I will go back to, yeah, um, getting, uh, I think it was a PS, PlayStation 1. First first big console. Yeah, I never had a Mega Drive. I played it around my mate's house. Come out in 97. Get a time machine. But yeah, I just didn't remember that because... I remember I had like a really like a few basic games on the on the computer I think but it was like the family computer and it was very basic and this is a thing that my family have now picked up that we do for all of us so I got the big present under the tree and I'm like that could be the big present and uh, they go uh, open open this present here and I open it it's from my my nana and uh, don't laugh <laughs> no <Not with> nana <laughs> Um, I'm just having some supper with Nana. <laughs> what do you call your Nana? Nana. Um, I'm not, I'm not dead before I was born, get over it. Uh, yeah, three, I had one grandparent. Yeah, she was grandma, not Nana. 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 Just supper Nana. with Nana. Um, some vegan buddies. <laughs> and they open, I open the present. Thank you, Nana. Dun, 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 it's a game. Da 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 da. PlayStation for my Christmas. Thank you, Nana. No, no. I got a PlayStation game. Uh, <laughs> right, let's move on to some more question games. No, I'm not bollocks to you now. Yeah, uh, Broken World was the reason I got what into this podcast. Nana, okay, I got, yeah. No, I got a PlayStation game and they, they tricked me. The raps up like it's a different game. Doesn't matter. The story's ruined. Uh, OG Stem Cell says Broken World was the reason I got into the podcast. What wrestling moments have made the other dadlies feel that way? Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Oh, Thanks, God. So. What was the question? What um, wrestling moments broke you like when I used to be broken Willborn with some dreadful WWE booking? Uh, WWE just being absolutely punished after WrestleMania uh, 17. I saw Steve Austin do the most just crap things imaginable to get heat. It sounded like um, some tosser who, like, you talk wrestling with at school or whatever. Was I not an hour day? I'll just get on. I'll, <laughs> I'll just get that last and smash her over the head with a steel chair about 20 times. And it's like, if you can get, you know, like, uh, Wayne to do, like, <laughs> to make his wrestling book, you know, like, his idea to get a character over good, then you, you're, you're finished. It was just everything was such a really nasty overcorrection. Like, it wasn't entertaining in the least. And then the invasion was just the kind of dorky thing that, uh, you know, the Kevin Owens video. When he talks about the cup. Yes. 
and smacking it against the wall. <laughs> and he goes, I was 17. Fairly certain, right? 2001, 15, 16. Yeah. I was writing little bits of like uh, A4 paper. What does WrestleMania 18 look like now? The ball WCW, Ultimo Dragon versus Mr. Perfect. I remember. <laughs> I wrote it down. That was on my undercard. Perfect's back as perfect. <laughs> WWF version. Perfect Plex versus Dragon Suplex. Smart. Indeed. I was 16. <laughs> I was 16 and I ruined it. The Triple H was uh, Holy Race. And a crap one to boot. That broke me. Like you, you've wait, you've you ruined everything. You've absolutely ruined it all. And I uh, like, uh, like beer and pussy now, guys. <laughs> Sorry. I liked alcohol pops and not getting any. So, <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, you know, uh, Hooching going home. Almost the same. <laughs> oh, uh, it was never a cul- gave up. It was a cool he, minute. He went well. full Rick Astley on the Fed. This guy. It's true. It was the cool minute. I, like the in 2013, I would nearly knocked it on the head, but I wasn't angry about it. I was just disappointed. That's worse, isn't it? Mm. Like the repeated beatdowns by the authority of Daniel Bryan and the Big Show coming out and saying yes. I was like, You're taking the piss, lads. You are taking the piss. <laughs> you were alive, Joey. <laughs> yeah, and, uh, I was in Birmingham, UK, England. When the big show's telling me and everybody else in the building, don't worry, Daniel Bryan asked me to kick his ass. Did he, Paul? <laughs> right there. So, but I wasn't angry Imagine about how it. demeaning that must have been for him to come out. Yeah. Uh, uh, that, Sensing that's the fun. vibe. That's like, funny to just think of his headspace going through that curtain of, <sighs> I suck. <laughs> 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 I got pretty annoyed. It might still be on the feed unless Acast have nuked it going back to this date. Pandemic was rough, and I did not need one final beat to mark the beginning <laughs> of the end of NXT. I didn't mind losing a spreadsheet water to Sidgwick every week. AW was just better by then. Mm. I was angry losing it in 2019 because some of that was trash on TNT. But like by 2020, there was a clear winner. There was a clear winner. Yeah. As early as April, there was a clear winner. February. And uh, Yeah, and the pandemic wasn't helping and anything, no. right, full stop. And then that, that frigging thing, Triple H leaning in the corner of the ring, like... Honestly, <laughs> Triple H leaning like that, I'd have thought there's less chance of Vince McMahon ever resigning in disgrace as it was of Triple H being considered a good booker again. I was like, we're done. Thanks, Paul. Thanks for the memory. Good run. It's over. If he didn't have that, we wouldn't get two point oh. So, yeah, well, yeah, it had to means just the rainbow the, and it's just by the end. It means that like we had to have, but we went on for so long. Yeah, NXT being that bad, that and the fatal four way Iron Man match. Like a one-two oh, punch. Oh, yeah, that was a piss take. Absolutely it's got to be a winner me. next week. Uh, if anything. <laughs> for an hour. In, like, empty, full sale. It's be- also an, an hour all- of desperation to work a great match. Even yeah. the likes of Dax Hall would say, come on, calm down, boys. <laughs> that, that's, that was the other thing as well that really wound me up is I thought they were on something really good of, we're going to get a one, two, times up. Oh, no. You then just went one, two, three, draw. Uh, and I was like, you... You can't do this. They can't yeah. keep getting away with this. Yeah, ridiculous. Uh, right, let's get some uh, quick final few questions. Uh, just a statement, actually, here from uh, Matt Reigns. There aren't any better people to break down, analyze, and criticize pro wrestling for the internet trolls. I just checked my watch, and it's... Same as thing, mate. Yeah. <laughs> Have a great guys. Have a great day, guys. Thank you again. Love you, Matt Thanks, Reigns. Matt. Thank you very Thank you. much. Yeah, we... It, I know you got a bit I, annoyed I a about this really recently. Down. We do... It's on me, really. I had a tantrum. <laughs> it, was, it was really hitting me how close we were to Christmas. A lot of family time. I just, in my brief... I'd Projected. Why, you did a bit of projecting. That's why I should knock off X in November like I normally do. Because it's like, well, I can go there and I can go and two-foot at anyone I want. And nobody can say anything. I can't two-foot my kids. Uh, <laughs> uh, oh, just people need to grow up. They need... Uh, uh, sometimes I do get a bit empathetic. Like, what must be going on in your life if your key priority is to defend with everything in your soul to the point where you get nasty and defensive and you project, oh, this wrestling company means everything to me and it can't be bad ever. You can't be very fulfilled. Yep. But at the same time... Nice way to look at it. Same thing, grow up. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to book club or something. I don't know. Get out, get out my mentions. Uh, Eric Vasquez says... Hey! Join a booking club and you know what good stuff looks like. Says, Hi there, just curious as to what some of these podcast specials guests' reactions would have been had they been live at Capital Carnage 1998. Sige, um, if, you know, let's just say the NXT champion had been in attendance at Capital Carnage 1998, what would he have said about, I don't know, 
particularly popping moments of that show. <laughs> they were all oh, 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 very entertaining. Uh, uh, demeaning myself. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Eric. Uh, Eric I love you, Eric. Thank you. Eric also writes, uh, are you jacking off? Um, yeah. I just like to jack. Michael Valley, the third, says, is it door or is it no door? Are you having a giraffe? Just, just some... Yeah. Pull the string on his back. Johan Benson, very serious question to uh, to end the year with. Uh, what would team talks be like if Gareth Southgate was replaced by Jeff, Jeff Hardy or Dax? <laughs> well, I ain't no soccer manager. <laughs> well, I tell you this, you go out there and you fight with everything you got for your family. <laughs> okay. Come on, Jeff. I'm stuck on uh, Ghost, Jeff Hardy now. <laughs> 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 so, uh, everybody uh, knows about your passing patterns. If don't make them square. They got to be triangular. I've been walking down <laughs> corridors of uncertainty for 25 years. Just put the goddamn ball there. <laughs> Go on, kid, make yourself famous. <laughs> Today, England will be playing 4-4, four, four, boo. <laughs> Offside, I must get the rules because the ball never left the pitch. One, two, <laughs> three, four. That's more corners than a usual triangle. <laughs> <laughs> what if the pitch started shaking? Now? <laughs> Wouldn't that make it better? No, Jeff, it wouldn't. How can a net be a thing when it's full of holes? Think about it. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> what? <laughs> another question. Uh, Travis, the legend's in the chat. Thank you, Travis. Thanks, Travis. Snag front row seats for Dynamite in Toronto. Oh, yeah. Sign ideas. Oh, Travis has made some of the all-timers. Travis has made some of the uh, all-timers... Um, if you want to put us over, that's absolutely great. Yep. But in terms of like who's really got over in AEW this year and could probably do the shout out, I'd probably have to say Prince Nana. Yeah. Uh, final few questions. Um, oh, John's so waiting for a, a question. <laughs> I can shoehorn that dig in it, my very good friend there. What was the game? Sorry. What was the game? That you open first is like that. <gasps> Does this mean I'm getting a place? No, it was the right, no, this is the point. It, if, if I'd been allowed to tell the story, I'd explain this to you. Um, they tricked me by saying it was a, it was an old game. It was a game for the computer, and then they'd hidden the real game inside it, but I didn't realise nice. that until I opened the main press. But it doesn't work. It doesn't matter now. Uh, John Patrick <laughs> says... John Patrick said, should AW push Osprey to the moon? They have a tr bad track record of bringing wrestlers in and then becoming mid-carders. They should do everything in their power to make Will Osprey as special as possible. Otherwise, you get nothing out of him or next to nothing out of him other than great matches. You see them every week nowadays. We say this all the time. At some point, you need to make one of these huge names that you sign an actual difference maker who can walk in and be an AEW champion, AEW champion caliber main event star. Otherwise, I do not know what you're doing and I've got no idea. And it's a presentation issue with AEW. I've always said Tony Khan is an infinitely better booker than promoter. He sometimes doesn't know how good his own product is mm -hmm. in terms of like the video recaps, like the bluster, like I've got an important announcement. So like you get that element of it, I guess. But in terms of the pomp, the circumstance, the gaga of it all, I think so. Like, look, at, he gets a card around a t-shirt. What are you doing? Mm -hmm. um, I think he really needs to take a step back and think, what can I do to make Will Ospreay feel special? And it's not win a few matches. It's like the whole presentation. Come up with a bespoke entrance for him. Like all these little cues, visual, whatever, that tell you this guy's a massive deal and he's coming in to change the game. Like, I'm not even the biggest Will Ospreay guy, okay? I get kind of almost exhausted by his work. I'm not saying it's all in the same style. I've never seen a great 10-minute Will Ospreay match, and maybe he's going to have to learn how to really work one. But he, he is the consensus best wrestler in the world, even if I do not share said consensus, and you should do everything in your power to just make it feel like the biggest deal possible. 
Yeah, I'm in complete agreement with Sir John Osprey as a wrestler, but I think, dare I say it, there's some maybe homework copying from how they're currently promoting Punk and Cody in WWE using Wembley as the destination. Yeah. He alluded to how excited he was to be at Wembley again next year, but as an AEW wrestler when he did that, oh, right, guys, shut up. <laughs> Nobody's talking well. Like, but that was the one thing he was kind and of... If asked. anything, they're being nice. So. Yeah. <laughs> felt like the one bullet, one bullet point, didn't it? It was like, mention Wembley next year, we're putting the tickets on sale. There's your finish the story. There's you. What I want to do is main event. He doesn't need to talk about the belt, but if he talks about Wembley with the same reverence, the implication is he's going to get to that level. He has arrived in AEW because this time around, he doesn't just want to be the special guest at Wembley. He wants to be the main event at Wembley. And even if he's not, even if he's not yet reached number one contender status by then, knowing that about him, will add focus to pretty much everything he does. It's a, if the ranking still existed, and who knows by February, maybe they'll be back, like it should be, well, I've got, what, seven months to get, like six months to get to that mm. point. Like I'd have to win this match, this match, this match to be worthy of the spot. I was just about, just about to say that because me and Sid talked about the rankings on the AW Collision review and were praying, off, especially off the back of the Continental Classic and how well that's been received, to for them to just... You know, you don't have to be completely beholden to it. It doesn't have to be whoever's top of the rankings automatically gets a title shot. You sort of, the, I said on the thing a bit, like a UFC influence of like, mm. okay, top four, you can sort of claim. Ah, that makes most sense in terms of like getting attention or it works best for the story or whatever it may be. But yeah, if you had Osprey come in, big, big, big matches to start off with, but also the fear of the, the thing we constantly circle back to of the, the Hangman Page, Brian Cage. Well, as long as he wins this, he's in the, he's got the title match. And then, oh my God, he's, he's dropped it. And now, how does he get back up to that? I think that would work perfectly. When I just think, I think that's my hope for AW's New Year's resolution: bring back the rankings. Bring back the rankings. Is there any possibility of them? What I would have done three months ago is say, right, the product's kind of going off a cliff. Realistically, um, we've never faced so much fan backlash. Mm. Um, if I was Tony Khan, I would say, right, okay, I would delegate it to one of my, like, he apparently has got a team on his creative or in his management structure who are really good at, like, continuity, like, data, all the rest of it. Give him a three-month project away from the day-to-day, -day, like a project running alongside all of that in the background, right? Can you come up with, and it's going to be difficult with how big the roster is and the two shows and all the rest of it, and, like, too many belts. Your project is to give me a viable way I can do the ranking system and then I'll just do three months of my TV as planned and then I can really think about is this viable? So give someone on your creative team if you're paying them a real long-term project to see how feasible this is. It's less feasible than ever when you've got too big a roster and you've got a lot of people allegedly, allegedly saying, eh, I'm not going to do that job. What can you do with that? Oh, thanks. Go back yeah, to Fed. People don't like restrictions. No, I don't know. I probably do jobs. People, the wrestlers and people on, within that inner circle don't like restrictions placed upon them, but like sometimes tough. Yeah. It makes everything and everyone better. You I could do with uh, being a bit more of a vertebrate. It's it also... Just AW, tell them, right, go piss off then. If you don't want to do a job, why don't you go to WWE where you're probably not going to beat Roman Reigns and you might have to do a job to him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Tony Khan, for the longest time, and I, like I think it's still there, was credited for doing like a lot of nice things and mm. doing things differently to where they've been done before. A different thing you could do that's never really been done before is a promoter going, I got it wrong. A booker going, I mm. got it wrong. I'm bringing them back. Uh, and you could present it as I've listened to fans and I hear what you're saying and the rankings are coming. Ah, he doesn't have to say I was wrong. No, but people would be able to. Re it's like whenever they would, whenever they would address a storyline that felt like it was going a bit wrong and just not magically fix it, but just tweak it a little bit. And you're mm. like, I get that now. The Dark Order is always the example, but there were others. I think like the the feedback would immediately be positive, and you've never had the momentum like it after the Continental Classic mm. as well. Well, thank you uh, for all of your questions. Apologies we couldn't do this live once again, but we will do it again in the new year. And don't forget to join us on Christmas Day for Secret Band Take and uh, continue the conversation with us on X at What Culture WWE. Why well, say you can follow all three of us. You can follow Michael Hamlet at Michael Hamlet. Follow Michael Sidgwick at M Sidgwick. Follow me at Adam Wilborn. Follow us all at What Culture WWE and follow our brilliant producer. At is it's Adam Nicholas. Uh, subscribe to What Culture Wrestling, wherever you get your podcasts from, for daily wrestling podcasts. But for now, thank you all for your questions. My thanks to Hamlet Sidgwick. Thank you for joining us, and we will see you soon.